Okay. Hello. On behalf of State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister and the Oklahoma State Department of Education, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on completing the English Language Academic Plan, or the ELAP, for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, my name is Tom Kirk. I'm with the Office of Federal Programs, and I'm here with Dan Rule from the Office of Accountability, and we are going to walk through this together. Okay, first of all, the ELAP. The ELAP, in conjunction with the completed parental notification letter, fulfills the district reporting requirements for identified English learners, or ELs, outlined in Title I of the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Districts are required to provide the following information to parents of identified English language learners. Reasons for the identification of their child as an English learner and in need of placement in a language instruction educational program. We also need to provide the child's level of English proficiency, how such level was assessed, and the status of the child's academic achievement. You also need to um, inform the parents of the methods of instruction used in the program in which their child is or will be participating and the methods of instruction used in other available programs, including how such programs differ in content, instructional goals, and the use of English and a native language in instruction. Also, how the program in which their child is or will be participating will meet the educational strengths and needs of their child. You also need to communicate in this how such a program will specifically help their child learn English and meet age-appropriate academic achievement standards for grade promotion and graduation. And the specific exit requirements for the program including the expected rate of transition from such a program into classrooms that are not tailored for English learners, and the expected rate of graduation from high school, including four-year adjusted cohort graduation rates and extended year adjusted cohort graduation rates for such a program, if funds under this part are used for children in high schools. In the case of a child with a disability, how such a program meets the objectives of the Individualized Education Program, or the IEP, of the child as described in Section 614D of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. There also exist other legal requirements for written guidance regarding student removal from the EL program at parent request and options for choosing an alternate program if available. Okay, now let's look at the ELAP and walk through each section. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who is going to pull that up and thank you, Tom. what it looks like. All right. OK, so again, we're going to start at the home page of the SDE website. We're going to go to services. We're going to go to federal programs, Title III, Part A. And the ELAP right here, updated of April of this year. We're going to download that. It downloads as a Word document. Uh, and we did that on purpose, so districts would have the ability to fill it in just in, in basic Word or whatever office suite you're using. OK, so this is what the ELAP looks like. It's sectional. So in each section is kind of meant to address a specific uh, component in ESSA. So first off, it's pretty straightforward. All your student demographic information right here, you know, your district, school site, grade level, when, when they were initially identified. Important ones here are these two questions right here. Does your student have an IEP in place? One of the things that we are um, constantly answering questions about is that relationship between uh, SPED and EL. And if the student is identified as uh, special needs, or as having special learning needs, 
this ELAP really needs to be developed with that in mind. The, the ELAP should be whatever instructional practices are in place that are felt to be appropriate for that student should be developed between the student's IEP team plus whoever is managing the EL, uh, you know, managing the uh, incorporation of EL learning practices in class. So that's why that is required. Uh, current OSTP or norm reference test information. Younger, you know, a lot of times the OSTPs, especially if these are younger kids, the students will not have OSTPs yet since they don't test until third grade. NRTs, oftentimes student, uh, districts will benchmark using a star or dibbles or, or whatever um, their adopted assessment is. So this gives the teacher an idea of where that student is. And that's, that's the idea behind this. Ultimately, this is a compliance document, but it's really designed more to you know, hand to a teacher that is teaching this student, say, okay, this is a good snapshot of where this student is right now. And so they can maybe tailor their, their instructional practice better for that student. Current ELP testing information, again, this fleshes out where the student is right now. And one of the big advantages of using an ELP assessment rather than just using ELA, like an ELA measure from the OSTP test, where the ELA is basically measuring literacy uh, and reading comprehension, the WIDA test is meant to you know, measure all measure within a range of ability within the four domains of language. So you're getting a listening, reading, speaking, and writing, and that allows you to see a lot more nuanced view of where that student might be at that moment. Oftentimes, with the ELs that we have in the state, especially ELs that were uh, native-born in the United States, is that we'll see students that are functionally um, fully fluent in English in terms of listening and speaking. They grew up listening to uh, American television. They listened, you know, and they went, you know, went maybe went to a preschool that had, you know, a lot of native native English speaking peers. But at home, they were maybe only read to or uh, in their native native language. So you can have students that speak completely fluently. You would not even imagine that they were functionally illiterate in in English, even though they speak it fluently. So. If you are just looking at one score or another, sometimes little things like that can get missed, but you can see, sometimes see very large disparities between the listening and speaking components and the reading and writing components on WIDA. And that's one of the reasons why we have it here. So you have the ability as a teacher to tailor that instruction appropriately given where that student is. Next on section four, the current uh, K access. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me backtrack to section three and two real quick. These scores are available to you. Now, if you're Filling this out in a smaller district that where you, this is kind of handed to you personally and said, go ahead and do these for all these kids, understand that your district is provided all this information from the state every year. If that student tested WIDA on the previous year, you have the information for the screener from your previous, if, or from the, the uh, sorry, the uh, access from the year previous for this one. If you, you are gonna do the screener, you have this information or, or the model, which is the alternate test for uh, identifying a student or one of the alternate tests for identifying a student, you have this information. Again, again, you for the norm reference test will have this information and potentially you can have the OSTP scores that are provided to you by SDE every year. So all this information should be available to you. If you don't have direct access to it, I would recommend reaching out to your district test coordinator and or you know, depending on how your district is lined out in terms of responsibilities, maybe an assistant superintendent, principal, somebody in your district will have this information that is provided from the state. So section four is the current uh, K-Access Access or Alternate Access scores. These would be from the previous year or the most recently available for this particular student. Highlighting right here on, on growth targets, this is something that might be a little bit more difficult and we are probably going to provide some additional guidance just because this requires a calculation and is a little bit more involved of a process. There's not just right now one place that you can go unless you're in a specific category of district. So we're going to provide a little bit of additional guidance to fill this out. As of right now, this can be an estimate that it, if you're filling this out by hand, you can estimate based on when that, that student was initially identified and then their years to exit and whether or not you feel they're on track to exit. 
So number five is a student's language development goals. And these are very similar to um, if you've ever uh, done a SMART goal before, uh, you know, time bound, you know, whatever, you know, and it just basically is something that says, okay, this is what this student should be able to do within a given amount of time. So I'm going to show you how to find these. These are based off of uh, the WIDA, what they call the can-do uh, targets. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over here to the internet and go to the WIDA website. I'm just going to type can-do. All right, and so the can-do descriptors are broken down within grade bands. So we're going to say hypothetically that the student that whose ELAP we're working on is a second grader. So we're going to go to the can-do descriptors for grades two to three. Oh, they changed the website on me. I'm sorry. It wasn't like this last week. <laughs> I think this is it. Okay, so uh, this would be, there's a actually a better PDF that's color that I, I like a little bit more than this one, but it's the same content. So hypothetically, when we look at our ELAP, we're going to look at listening, key use area, ELP level, and target. So we're going to look up here at our, if this student had never been identified before, hypothetically, we're going to look up here at their screener and say, we're going to say that they had a listening score of 2.1, hypothetically. Oh, helps if I put number lock on. So now we're going to go back to our can do descriptor. And we're going to look at the students a lower level two, and we're going to look on listening. And we're going to see if there's a reasonable, what, what a goal that we feel would be reasonable for that student to do for that given, what the student should be able to do after, give, after one year of instruction. What's reasonable for a 2.3 student, someone who would be considered emerging, emerging in their language proficiency at the second grade, identifying the who, where, and when of illustrated statements. That would be a good, a good goal. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We would say um, the student will be able to identify the who, where, and when of illustrated statements, which would be a reasonable goal given where the student is at a lower level of listening after one year of instruction. Actually, sorry, messed that up. You want to use it level three. So identifying linking words. If the student had been a 1.1, that level two goal would be where you go. So the, at level three, we're shooting generally about uh, one one increase in level per year. So identifying linking words or phrases related to passage of time and speech, Monday next day, so, you know, that's a reasonable goal given one year of instruction. And you do the same thing for each individual goal. See if they have the yield, the key use areas in this one. Okay, this particular document does not list the key use areas. Oh, yeah, sorry, right here. The key use areas are recount, explain, argue, and discuss. And, yeah, okay, and they're listed up here. So you would say for the goal that we chose to use, the level three on listening right here, this would be a recount key use area. So we would just put that right right there. And then the EOP level obviously is level three. So that's essentially how this particular section works. It's not meant to, and you can put multiple targets in. I mean, you'd need a minimum of one just because the teacher would have to have an idea of where to go, but there's not a, not a requirement that it, you know, only be one. You can put in two to three different learning targets just to make sure that the teacher, and more is probably better, to say this is where the student would be reasonably able to test after one year of instruction. And that gives the teacher a better idea of what that student's abilities are within that particular language domain. Because again, 
you can oftentimes overstate what a student's literacy level is based on the fact that you can have a, a fully fluent conversation with them in the hallway and assume that they have that equivalent level of, of literacy. And that can, that's a mistake that ends up uh, really hurting some of our students sometimes. So number six, language instruction services. This is functionally your, your LIEP for this student. All right, this is what you're gonna do for this kiddo in, in school. Are they gonna get sheltered instruction? Are they gonna get be in self-contained SPED? Are they gonna be given pull-out ESL services? Are they gonna be you know, kind of mainstream with the teacher supporting their instruction, you know, 100%. This is where you'd say, this is, this is how we're addressing this student's learning needs. And if any comments uh, required that are gonna be, that maybe you feel one of these doesn't specifically address what you're gonna be doing, feel free to go in and, and supplement what you want, what this is gonna look like in your, at, the state, at your uh, site level. Uh, participation in the state required assessment and accountability system. Here's where you check whether or not the student is going to be uh, tested in uh, access or alt access, or they're gonna be testing with the OSTP or the OAP. We want to make sure that everyone understands where the student is going to be testing because it matters for accommodations, which come up next. So accommodations for OSTP, these are the allowable uh, accommodations for any student that's classified as EL to take with the OSTP exams three through eight. All right. Now there is a guidance document available from OSDE for all your EL testing accommodation needs and uh, it is available on the assessment page under the EL document section. And it'll let you, it'll kind of do, help define out what some of these mean and whether or not there's any specific uh, criteria that go along with that specific accommodation. And there are, uh, and that's why the, the note is in here. Some of these have asterisks. Some of them, uh, accommodations are not just straight accommodations. Some of them have to be administered in a specific way for test validity. So if you're gonna do an accommodation on OSTP testing, want to make absolutely sure that that accommodation is implemented in the correct way or you risk having your scores invalidated and no one wants that. So what goes along with accommodations in testing is accommodations in the classroom. If a student is going to be given accommodations on the OSTP, that should not be the first time that student sees that particular accommodation. Any accommodations that um, are aligned with testing should be aligned in general instruction with the student over the course of the year. We shouldn't be trying to show a student what a word-to-word -word dictionary is the, the morning that they're taking the OSTP. That's, that's not best practice. That student should be well-versed in what, they, what their accommodations are because they've been a component of regular classroom instruction for the entire year, okay? So these accommodations right here, there's no set really definition for what they all mean all the time in all circumstances. They're re, you know, meant to be considered reasonable. And these should always be developed as a committee, not one teacher just checking boxes saying, this is what I think the student needs at this particular moment. This should be a collaborative committee-based decision for whoever is designing the ELAP for the students or for the student body for that site. All right, lastly, signatures. Whoever completes the document signs off. Whoever is responsible for making sure that it's implemented signs off. There should always be somebody who is in charge of making sure that these things are done and done correctly. Because just having the document is only half the battle. Making sure that it's actually used for its intended purpose, making sure that it is informing instruction and those accommodations that are built in for that student, especially since those accommodations need to be implemented a specific way for uh, end of year testing uh, validity, it needs to be done correctly, and there needs to be some level of formal oversight built into this process to ensure that that occurs. And the printed name of the supervising site administrator for where that, that student is attending. Last section, parental opt-out. Under federal law, parents have the right to opt their students out of any supplemental EL service if they don't feel that they want their child in it. But part of the deal is that if a parent opts out, they need to know exactly what they're opting out of. So that requires that the ELAP, that no matter what, a student and a student that's been identified as EL needs to have a completed ELAP. That ELAP needs to be given to their parents. 
or their guardians, and they can say, they can make a choice at that point, and after that, what the content of the LFP is explained to them, either through a district translated version of the document or through verbal translation, if they still want to opt their student out of services, they have that right. That's fine. Now, it's important to know, and this is mentioned, this is part of the, the note right here, is that even if a student is opted out of EL services, they do not opt out of EL status. No matter what, what we're talking about of opting out is only opting out of the supplemental instructional services that will be provided to that child due to their EL status, not that they opt out of the extra EL testing. The, the student, once they've been identified, they'll still continue to test with the WIDA assessment until they're proficient. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a hard line. We don't, that's nothing you can get out of. So if you do have a parent that chooses to opt out, Oftentimes, it's been my experience that they're opting out because they feel they're opting out of the assessment component as well. If it's explained to them and they understand that no matter what, if you, you're, you, you can take these supplemental services for your, your student or you cannot take your supplemental student for this service, for this, this status, but regardless, you're going to test at the end of the year. And if we're, if you give us kind of the, you know, the ability to kind of tailor instruction to your student, we're probably going to get, get them out of the status faster. If, it, if the argument is presented to the parents like that, oftentimes you don't see the parents necessarily wanting to opt out anymore. Again, it's just making sure that everyone is on the same page so everyone knows what they're getting and everyone knows what other things are going to happen if a signature is put on or not put on, okay? So that is basically that. And many districts are also using one of the, the two larger EL information systems in the state. And just to cover this real quick, both systems create a version of this document. Just, and, if, and if you're using one of those, those EL management systems, either Elevation or EduSkills, the document that that system creates isn't accepted. It's in line with uh, everything that we have here. You don't need to, to redo this specific document if you're already using one that's automatically generated from that system. That's fine. This, is, this document we provide to those districts that are dealing with usually smaller populations of ELs and need to do these more by hand. So that is that. I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Tom. Okay. Okay. Well that, that wraps everything up. Um, please feel free to contact us with any questions or concerns you may have, or if we can assist you in any other way. Again, I'm Tom Kirk.